Hello, Blenders, and welcome, welcome to episode number 242 of Real Blend, a podcast that welcomes back its patron saint. On this week's show, Glass Onion is finally hitting Netflix after being in theaters what feels like months ago. Damien Chazelle's Babylon is opening in theaters, and to celebrate that fact, the director, very special to this show, patron saint of Real Blend, uh, joins us later on in the show for a wonderful wonderful interview um and by us i mean jake hamilton of fox 32 in chicago hello jake what what an interview to to wrap the year on appropriately i feel i feel like we've knocked off a couple of big ones this year and And can uh, we we tease what he says in the final seconds of the interview if you want to sure yeah i don't say why i I believe he says and, and gabe correct me if i'm wrong quote i love this show he did say that yeah made me feel really good and I also Maybe. love this show. So Damien Chazelle and I are like the same person. You know who else loves the show? <laughs> Kevin McCarthy, Fox 5 Washington. Huge DC. fan. <laughs> what if he was like, I actually don't think it's that great, to be honest with you. Yeah. And this is a really cool interview. And obviously we'll get to the setup, but uh, very, very cool that he's our, this was all of our last interview of the year. Every, mm-hmm. each yep. of us, um, which I thought was really special. Well, it should we, be. We, uh, we, and we, you know, we do a lot of television interviews, but we got to end the year on a real blend interview with a big guest. So, oh, and in I, fact, I, I was like given I was offered uh, Cameron um, tomorrow and I said, no. Yeah, said, Spielberg was trying to do Spielberg's the show in next my week. living room right now. And yeah. I'm trying to get him to get out. He won't do it. <laughs> he won't do it. Please. I'm tired of watching the Fablemans. <laughs> <laughs> uh, OK, uh, Kevin, tell me I'm wrong. I, I asked Damien Chazelle a question which yielded an answer that was basically like a gift wrapped present for Kevin McCarthy. Yes, it was. His, yeah, but yeah. The second he started speaking, I was like, oh, this is such a Kevin answer. Oh, I was just like, I was, I was, I was in a trance just watching him talk about it. I was, I was like, watching you whenever like, you yes, were talking. Damien. Yeah. Yes, Damien. <laughs> <laughs> All right. You guys will get to that in a second. Let's get through some housekeeping as uh, first at the top of the show. If you are watching us on YouTube, hello. Thank you very much for joining us. Uh, it's Friday morning, hopefully, and you guys are part of the no- notification crew. Uh, if you want to uh, please give us a like and a subscribe. We crossed over 10,000 subscribers uh, this year. We're very, very excited about that. If you're listening to us in audio form and want to figure out how to join us in video to see what we all look like, uh, we are at YouTube.com backslash Real Blend podcast. Um, in the details of this episode, you can find out how to sign up for the Real Blend Premium, the premium episode premium. Uh, drops every Monday. Uh, bonus content with the guys, including some really fun games. Uh, you get a newsletter, not this week, but I'll have one for you next week. I think, depending on the holiday, I'm undecided at that point. Uh, I might take a week off. I'm really sorry about that. Uh, and an ad free version of the show. So it's a really good reason to sign up for the premium episode. Uh, as mentioned, check the description for information on where. To sign up. Now, we have an update uh, that I'm going to throw to producer Gabe. Gabe, how are you today, sir? I'm good. Thank you. Uh, Just a quick update for the folks listening at the top of this show. Next week uh, is going to be our last show of the year. We have our top tens that you guys are going to go through, which uh, will then reveal our top five films of 2022 as a podcast. Um, But I wanted to note the week following that uh, is the week that we're going to take off for the holidays as a as a much earned break and we'll be back uh the week after that which will be january 13th with tom hanks so if you don't see us in your feed for a week that is supposed to happen we won't be posting a premium that week we won't be posting um a main show that week but we'll be back and and hitting the ground hitting the ground running yes running guys people listen to our show uh the first Tom Hanks interview we did, you got to go back and find it. Uh, it's for Elvis. It was earlier this year. This one is not an interview. This is like it's basically <laughs> Tom Hanks co-hosting Real Blend for 35 yeah. minutes. It, yeah, it is very funny. We were all in London. We were we have been doing interviews all day long and we'll set this up, obviously, when you hear the show on the 13th. But I just want to I want people to be ready for this one. This is a, this is a this is a special one. <laughs> it I really can't, is. I can't hear Tom Hanks is going to be on the show without double taking. Like, and yeah, it's like again, the second he's time he's on the show on. again. Yeah. And I'm like, what? Uh, speaking yeah. of return guests, uh, Damien yeah. Chazelle joined us when he was uh, he directed the first episode, first two episodes of a Netflix show called The Eddie, uh, which was very heavily rooted in jazz and music. And it made sense that he was an executive producer behind that and directing a few of the episodes. Uh, 
we're lucky enough to have him come back onto the show now to discuss his film Babylon, which we're going to uh, interview in depth later on in the show. But review, Damien is a uh, review. Is that what I said? Interview? Yes, yes, yes. We're going to interview yeah. the film. I don't know how we we're going to. I suppose interviewing the director is as close as you can get. Close yeah. as you can get. Um, Damien's one of these guys who just feels like he's he fits in the show. I mean, you'll you'll see yeah. with this conversation, you know, the way that he Very handles loose. questions and answers. Great dude. Huge fans. Uh, Whiplash, La La Land, First Man. Also, we got and, confirmation of a Babylon sequel. And <laughs> confirmation of a Babylon <laughs> sequel. Uh, so without further ado, Damien Chazelle, patron saint of the Real Blend podcast, uh, back on the show. Uh, we lovingly uh, christened you the patron saint of Real Blend uh, a while back when we... Uh, nice. Well, we were, you know, we, we were starting out as a short time how did, how did podcast. I get, how, yeah, how did I get that honor? That's awesome. Well, y- you were in between La La Land and First Man, who are, you know, two movies that we are just in love with. And we were just checking out your run of films and getting excited about what you were going to work on next. And we talked about you so often. So it's like there's like a, a rush more. There's like Nolan and you and Spielberg and Scorsese, I'm going to assume. So Tarantino. Yeah. You're up there. Tarantino's got, yeah, Tarantino's on there, but you're up there high for us. And so we just came up with uh, the patron saint of Roblin, and we're going to ride with that. So that is, that's the best honor. I'm going to, I'm just going to carry that like a badge. I'm, I'm, <laughs> I'm, 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 Shove I'm, the Oscars aside. I'm going to, yeah. I'm going to start being way more arrogant now. I love it. <laughs> good. good. Just let it all hang out on this show. Um, but, so this yeah, is just yeah. to say, just watch out. I'm going to be insufferable from now on. <laughs> You'll fit right into this podcast then. Yeah. So this is just to say we're huge fans. Um, and I want to start with a, Thanks, a real quick story. Um, I have two sons and they don't love movies uh, the way that I do. And I'm constantly recommending titles to them that I think that they were going to connect with. Like last night we watched uh, Moneyball because they're they're sports kids and my mm-hmm. oldest loves statistics. And I was like, OK, you're going to love this movie, but it's really hard to convince him. Um, and my oldest uh, son is in college and he texted me the other week and he said, oh, I finally watched this movie that you've been telling me to watch forever. Um, it's called Whiplash. And it's like my top three movies right now. And I was so uh, mad, cool. Damien, because I wanted to experience that movie with him for years. <laughs> and he kept being like, uh, eh, I don't really, I'm not that interested in it. And then he finally watched it on his own and it drove me nuts. Um, <laughs> and it got me thinking, if you have given any thought at all to the first movies that you're most excited to share with your kids. It's a great question. Cause I'm just getting into that, that zone. I have a three-year-old and, um, you know, uh, so right now, um, it, it's going pretty well, you know, honestly, right now he's, he's obsessed with the little mermaid and, uh, I'm, I'm totally in on that. I think that's great. You know, he, um, you know, it's definitely much better than he, he also has this obsession with, uh, have you heard of, of you, uh, your, your kids might be past this. Have you heard of Blippy? I have not heard of no. Blippy. <laughs> Blippy. No. Okay. Well, you guys, you guys are. <laughs> either missing out or very lucky depending on who <laughs> on, on who you ask it's this kind of like web web series tv show thing so it's like my son will kind of flip-flop between insisting on watching that all the time or he'll watch yeah the little mermaid or fox and the hound or the, the, those those are the you know a couple of the disney ones that he really likes so okay. you know uh it's it's been uh but man there's nothing like actually getting to watch uh you know i've now seen the little mermaid uh uh <laughs> more times than I ever thought I would see any movie, uh, ever, uh, <laughs> it, just, 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 in, just in the past few months. Uh, yeah. cause he, he, cause he, he was also sick for a bit. He had the flu. So, you know, when they're not, when they're sick, it's hard to say no when they say, put this on, you know? And yeah. so, man, this thing just, but I was shocked. It's just like, as soon as it was over, I just wanted to go right back to the beginning. And mm-hmm. after, you know, watch number six or something, I'd be like, you want to try something different now? You know, maybe, uh, <laughs> no. Mermaid. mermaid. <laughs> Always mermaid. So, yeah, wait, uh, wait till wait till you see what his dad did with the moon landing in first man. It's gonna blow his mind when he gets when he when he gets older, man. Uh, oh my god. That'll be that'll be uh yeah, that, that that'll be interesting. I did make the mistake of actually having him come by the edit room on Babylon <laughs> once. Now now to be fair, I I made sure that there was nothing completely depraved on the on the screen when he was walking by. It was the actually the moment where 
Yeah. <laughs> no, no, it was, it, it was, it was a moment of what I thought was totally G rated fair. It was Brad Pitt, uh, uh, giving a speech on a balcony and then fall, you know, you know, d- doing a little yeah. sort of move and falling sure. back. I thought, Oh, it's like, you know, Peter Sellers or something Chaplin. It's going to be funny. My son lost his mind. He was horrified. He thought <laughs> that he had just seen someone die and he ran out of the room screaming and for the next like week, he sort of had it in for me. It was just, it would just be kind of conjuring up. He kept saying, man, fall down, man, fall down. <laughs> like, 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 like oh, he had no. seen, you know, a, a, a oh, snuff no. film or something. Yeah. So that's, <laughs> so, so ever since then, yeah. Anytime I try to kind of, you know, give him a gander of what I'm working on, he's just, you know, he avoids it like the plague as, as, oh. as maybe he should. Damien, am so I the crazy first or, filmmaker or to it, traumatize your son is you. It, it, <laughs> I know it's I horrible. Cr- Am I crazy or did uh, in the trailer for the film Pitt does a dance before he falls and in the movie the, is the dance not in there like that like that thing he does that yeah he does it, it, it we wound up using two different takes of the of the so it's like he, he does a different move before falling but it's not the yeah yeah it's uh yeah you're 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 you're, you're, you're correct in your eagle eye uh, spotting I was wondering. Yeah. So obviously we, we've talked a lot about this movie on our show a lot. Um, you know, we, we are big fans of just celluloid film shooting on film. Um, there's a moment in this movie that is so incredibly intense as a character. I'm not going to spoil anything, but a character's trying to get a camera to a location and the anxiety that you feel in that scene when they tell him it'll be back in 30 minutes. And then it's like a couple hours later and he's rushing back. I was curious out of all the movies that you've made in your career, what is that big happy accident that you landed on where a shot just ended up being brilliant and it wasn't even just because of the planning and just because of the circumstances of it or the timing of it or something that just kind of magically happened like that. That's a good question. The, um, I would say the most beautiful thing I've ever filmed, I wasn't able to put in the movie because, uh, and you'll, you'll understand why in a second. It was because we were shooting the the um, the moonwalk in First Man, and we were out in this quarry, this giant quarry in Atlanta in the middle of the night, lit by this one sort of giant light simulating the sun that was off in the distance, single light source. And it started snowing. And so suddenly on the these IMAX cameras, I see this like the most perfectly backlit sort of Buzz Aldrin's coming down the 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 ladder. And this, like, the most sort of movie magic snow is just falling everywhere. I'm just like, at some point, I got to find a use for it or something. Couldn't quite make it into the movie, uh, as oh. you could expect. But, uh, you know, and of course, also, at the time, I think I didn't really appreciate the beauty of it because I was just pissed off because it was fucking snowing and <laughs> ruining my shot. But, uh, <laughs> but uh, um but we did, you know, insert some joke lines for Buzz and Neil to say to each other, of like, you know, gosh, Neil, it's snowing. Oh, who would have thought? But, you know, it, it kind of, uh, you know, it sort of went the way of, of most of that cutting room floor footage. But it is it is. Uh, um, so, you know, but, 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 but it is a little beautiful piece of a uh, piece of celluloid accident. You still have that? Like you, you have access to that like footage still, obviously? Yeah. Yeah. It's somewhere. Yeah, I thought you were just about to show it to us. I thought it was like right off to like, your left. <laughs> oh my God, really? Here you go. No, no, I wish. No, I wish. I wish. Uh, Damien, so much of, of this movie is about people in industry who are trying to deal with and, and learn about and overcome change. And, and they have to or they're going to be left behind. I was sort of curious, in, in your time in this industry, what is the biggest change in Hollywood or in movie making that you've had to, to deal with or to, to overcome in a way? I don't know about overcoming, but I definitely, you know, it's like uh, even right from when I first moved to Hollywood, you know, the the people were already saying that film, that celluloid was dying or or, or dead, you know, that the party was over. Um, everything was digital. I'd say um, during the course of my stay in Hollywood, as I was as I was first kind of getting into the business, digital projection began. Um, so I sort of got to witness firsthand the move from from everything being shown on 35 to everything being shown digitally um which uh which was sort of a i would argue sort of a sad uh sad event but um but the but then you know um the the flip side is that you know i kind of i mean i I, i've shot most of my not all but most of my movies on film and 
you know, it still definitely feels just as much of an option as it did when I came out. In fact, you know, I would sort of say that the 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 doom the doomsday uh, prophecies turned out to be wrong. Really, you know, it, it's uh, film outlasted. I think the skeptics and and it sort of feels like now we're in a you know a, a sustainable place. Knock on wood, where where. A lot of stuff is shot digitally, but if you want to shoot film, you still can. Um, the, uh, you know, I'd say the other big change, of course, is sort of what we're going through right now, I guess, the sort of debate about streaming versus the theatrical experience and, and sort of what that means, you know, and less things being made for the big screen. And, um, you know, I, I um, there too, I think that the, the, the doomsday sort of prophecies are going to prove to have been premature um, just, just as they were when radio came along and when television came along and when home video came along when the VHS came along, when pay-per-view came along, when the DVD came along. It's, you know, the, we've been, we've been through this cycle many times before and every time you'll find just as many headlines as you do today about the death of cinema, the death of theaters and et cetera, et cetera. You know, that said, I do think we're definitely, you know, you can't deny we're definitely going through a period of, you know, contraction or, some, you know, this is something where both sides of the business, the production side and the exhibition side are are going to have to adapt in some way, you know, and, and um, um, you know, uh, right now we're still a little bit in the, the, the sort of residue of the 90s multiplex spree, you know, where where so many feeders were built and, and you know. Um, so that's a little bit what you're seeing right now with a lot of theaters closing down. You know, you're just seeing a contraction. But, you know, I don't know, that can be a, it can be uncomfortable in the moment, but it can be a healthy thing for the business overall in the long term. So I think it'll find its feet, but it's, you know, it's uh, definitely a transition and we're we're sort of, you know, right in the middle of it, arguably. Uh, so I'm hearing Babylon 2 is what I'm hearing, just to, to just set in a different... <laughs> A different era of history. <laughs> I'm gonna do, yeah, yeah. I started with silent to sound. I'll just do each uh, each transition, but but it'll get more and more arcane and inside baseball. You know, I think by by by, by, by the time I'm making the like, you know, replacing the 35 millimeter prints with DCPs in the theaters, you know, I, I think I'll have lost most of my audience, but like they'll we'll still, still be, be there. You, you you guys will still be front row, exactly. Yeah, it's, right. like a, a, it's like a link later uh, experiment that you're committing yeah, to. Uh, us and Christopher Nolan will be front <laughs> Yeah, uh, just you guys. Damien, I um, sat in the Q and A that you had with Cameron Bailey uh, up in TIFF, and you know oh, at cool. the time when you were doing it, we hadn't seen footage. We saw the the bits that you brought, but not the entire movie. And I was just re-listening to the audio from it today. You were talking about uh, when you finished the script. Uh, you actually being appalled uh, is of some of the things that you had put into the script and and almost afraid to show it to different people because you weren't sure how they were going to respond. Um, mm -hmm. Now that we have been able to see the movie a couple of times, I was just hoping you could maybe elaborate on some of those topics or materials uh, that really scared you when you explored them. Yeah, I. Um, yeah, it was the first time I'd kind of had that feeling since the only other time was Whiplash, where where. Uh, so I guess, you know, in both cases, you have certain kinds of extreme behavior, extreme language, extreme, you know, uh, uh, in different ways, of course. Um, but like uh, the 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 idea of putting a microscope uh, on, you know, sort of uh, using a microscope to look at the uglier sides of uh, of of, well, humanity, but more specifically art making, you know, uh, and, um, you know, I think uh, resulted in some of the same sort of things winding up on the page that uh that yeah were definitely sort of outside my comfort zone and 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 probably outside a lot of people's comfort zones um but as with whiplash i guess i kind of sort of felt uh you know felt sort of strongly inside that that the the fear was part of the point you know that 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 that, that the more out there the more risky the more sort of on the edge the material in the script was the closer to what the movie wanted to be, we actually were that it had mm. to actually reflect a little bit of the, the real transgressiveness and sort of risk taking and insanity of the period that in many ways I think has been sort of forgotten or overlooked or kind of covered up in, in sort of the annals of Hollywood history. We sort of easily forget just what a circus it, 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 uh, it sort of was at its outset and also just what a wildly, rule-breaking transgressive taboo busting time the 20s in general were mm -hmm. um so you know it's sort of like 
if you're going to make a movie about the 20s or early Hollywood that doesn't shock and offend and appall some people, I would argue you're not really doing your job. You're not really right. doing justice to the period because that's that's what it was. It was yeah. one shock after another. It was a complete demolition of all the cultural norms that had come before. Right. Um, and uh, yeah, and just that raw spirit of willful transgression. You know, Damien, there's an amazing actress in this film, Olivia <laughs> Hamilton, that I wanted to bring up because uh, I, I and for people who don't know, this is your wife and, and, and she's incredible in the film. And I wanted to ask about because you're directing her as a director. She's a director in the film. Yeah. So I wanted to know what like was that a weird like inception type thing where like you're directing your wife who's a director in the film? Was like was there a key to like doing that? Like what was that like that conversation like with her? <laughs> Well, I would say she directs me in real life. You know, she's definitely the alpha in the relationship. So, you know, there, there's always, there always is one, you know, and, uh, and so it, it kind of fit like a glove. She, she, um, um, there was this weird kind of meta thing because it was the first week of shooting was the, the sort of sequence where she's first directing Margot, And, um, and I sort of modeled her a little bit on Dorothy Asner and, and some of the other kind of female directors of the period who, as you as you can imagine, just given the world that they were in, you know, were pretty tough. Take no, you know, take no prisoners, no bullshit people, you yeah. know, probably, probably by necessity. So um, but again, that's kind of close to in some ways close to who she is, not that she's at all the person you see on screen. But, you know, I sort of knew how to pull that out of her. And and um, <laughs> and by the time we were shooting, you know, it's like Margot was sort of so much part of the family as well. We were all, you know, kind of in it together there was a long rehearsal prep period with margo and everything so yeah by those first days of shooting it it did feel natural it felt like a family and and we're all sort of you know giving feedback to each other and it, you know felt a little less like uh like the formal kind of thing that that it might have been otherwise and it's one of the best scenes in the film too if pe people check it out i mean she's amazing that, the, the that performance in this movie yeah are amazing pj burn everybody Margo's yeah. face clicks from when they say action and she goes hi god hi boys i was like oh, <laughs> oh my god look at that that's a, what star. a moment yeah yeah uh, right the Damon... star is born yeah yeah i want i want to talk about uh, the casting of uh james mckay who is just brilliantly played by toby mcguire like toby just crushes that part and this is like a character who we build up to over two plus hours so the casting kind of has to work perfectly or the, all the shocks of his moments and his character don't work and honestly i never would have thought of toby for this part i feel like if i'd read it on the page but it it's kind of genius how well it works i'm sort of curious how you came up with the idea of casting toby in that part and uh like it's, it's just this an insane fucked up dude and was there anyone else you ever yeah. thought about before getting to toby and he, he needs some teeth whitening as well i, I would argue <laughs> <laughs> you know, i just yeah give him a toothbrush the the the, the, the um you know it, yeah it was definitely um I knew even before it was Toby in mind, you know, it sort of definitely knew we needed someone where, cause it is kind of a, you know, it's a real entrance moment when you sort of, when the camera kind of finds him. And as you said, you've sort of built up to this character for a bit. So, you know, and you're also at a, at a stage in the movie, you're sort of entering the last third or, you know, or last quarter of the film. And so you kind of need to give the audience that, that one last sort of, fire underneath their seat that one last kick in the pants to sort of propel you to the to the finish line now um so you need to change the game in some way so um so i knew it needed to be someone where just just sort of seeing them seeing their face seeing how they're dressed just that first appearance of them before they even say a word would would uh, have an impact you know and uh but the Toby, you know, it, it, that being specifically Toby, I think it, it sort of came about very organically. He, he used to work with the, or my producer, uh, Matt, Pl there, there were three producers in the film. Uh, Olivia was one of them. So she was wearing two hats um, wow. and uh, uh, Mark Platt, um, who I'd worked with on La La Land. And then and then Matthew Pluff, uh, you know, younger producer who I'd sort of initially pitched the project to back like 12, 13 years ago. Um, you know, he, he, in the interim had worked with Toby. I got to meet Toby through him. And so, and Toby came on as an executive producer. And so again, before he was even in the movie at all, we just were all trying to figure out practically how to get it made. We all just sort of loved this project and what it could be. And so we would do read throughs at like Toby's office. We would just sort of like sit there and whatever, you know, sort of actor friends we had, or, or even non-actor friends, you know, we'd have sort of the casting director or other producers or assistants, you know, just sort of sit at the table, read parts. Um, 
Toby being Toby, anytime he was able to actually join, I would sort of throw like six parts his way. I'd just try <laughs> to give him like half the script. Um, and so I got to hear a lot of the parts through, through his words. He's, uh, you know, he, 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 he does a mean German director really well. He does a, uh, he, uh, he, he did PJ's role, uh, uh, pretty brilliant, brilliantly, not taking anything away from PJ who utterly crushes it, of course. Oh yeah. Um, but, uh, tuck but, it, just but tuck it that, in. That, that's, that's, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> which, which, uh, yeah, I think, yeah, he improvised that. Yeah. I had the erection line written and then PJ, yeah, he's always, he's always like, busting into the shot he just he literally kind of his head just pops into the frame he wasn't even supposed to be in the shot he's just like i'm getting in tuck it <laughs> about, you know, but, but you got you gotta love it but anyway uh, toby played one of the uh one of one of those read-throughs he played mckay and and um and so we wound up talking about you know eventually i was sort of like fuck i mean you're so fun in all these parts and they're all kind of so different for you uh would you consider playing one of them for real not just in a read-through and and he said sure and we talked it through and and i was almost surprised he's the one who out of the range of parts we we had given him uh or sort of talked about he he, he gravitated towards the the sickest of them all so yes. i don't know what that says about him but yes. there you go <laughs> great performance yeah. uh damien we hear um filmmakers talk a ton about finding their uh movie in the edit but your editing with tom cross is, is just so precisely in tune with your music I feel and that even in like the chaos of a party uh, or the brilliant, brilliant scenes of on the movie sets where multiple productions are going on at different times, uh, it appears to me that you you capture everything the day the day of the film um, with the idea of the rhythm and the edit determined. And I'm wondering if that is that mm -hmm. actually the case and how is the relationship with you and Tom sort of evolved from movie to movie? Yeah, it's it's um, I think it's always a mix kind of a you know, really sort of um, precisely planning everything in advance, often with the music as as the sort of glue or the driving pulse to it. But um, but then, you know, uh, invariably we find that when Tom just sort of literally follows the storyboards or the animatics that I've put together with the music, initially, you know, something will always be missing. And that something usually is the humanity. Uh, that the actors have brought to it or that or, 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 or the sort of the little accidents you didn't expect that happened on on set. Um, and so that's where I'd say the real creative editing comes in is, is we once we have that foundation, which usually does comport pretty closely to the planning. Um, uh, then then you sort of start experimenting and, and start exploring. You try to actually forget the planning and you probably wind up somewhere halfway. You know, you wind up somewhere that has one foot in what was always conceived uh, and, and one foot in something totally different that just came about from the shooting and from, you know, maybe a piece of improvisation on set or a piece of, you know, a, a, a moment in the, you know, the, the camera catching something you didn't expect, you know? Um, so yeah, it's, it's, uh, it's that constant balance, I would say between, mm. between, um, precision and accident. Ideally. So, uh, Damien, we're only given about five minutes left, so um, I'm going to let you know that we're going to put this question up against a, a wall where we're going to have like a, where, like a spoiler discussion will be. So this will not be heard without a warning. Uh, and this also is going to come out the day the movie is released. Um, but I have to ask you about that montage at the end, because it is mind blowingly awesome just to see the the life of cinema. And as you can see, I have a Terminator arm behind me. So just to see, yeah. you know, <laughs> the, you had two Cameron films in there. I just want to know about that montage, putting it together and the idea that there's two films in theaters this Christmas that have Pandora in them. It's pretty wild <laughs> to think about that. So I, I was just wondering, like, yeah. how you came about that. Like, does, is Cameron even uh, uh, does he know that those shots are in the film? And I'm just wondering, like, how oh, yeah. that came about. It's amazing. No, yeah, he had to get he had to give permission, uh, which was he was. Uh, no, yeah, we wouldn't have been able to get them without um, with, uh, uh, without his allowing us um, uh, to do that, you know, and, and uh, you know, very generously. Um, and the, the, um, you know, the, I mean, working backwards from that, the, the sort of irony of putting that sequence together was that it came together actually very fast. It was, it was sort of late in the editing process. We'd kind of basically finished most of the film. We were, we were even beginning to mix already. We wow. had done what we thought were our final recording sessions for the orchestra and whatnot. And we were starting to mix and color and, um, something just wasn't quite there in the ending. Um, 
and and so and so we just started kind of experimenting and um and it was like you know a day or two of just sort of very i'd say some of the most instinctive kind of experimentation i've ever gotten to do in an edit room or at least since my like student days you know where where you could kind of throw practicalities away and just sort of we had no idea if what we were doing would even be feasible but let's let, let's just go crazy and try some shit and just and just see because essentially the ending of the movie that we had was too normal and it's and it's just not it's not a normal it's not a movie that wants to be normal in any capacity it wants to be a little crazy and so it had to end in a way that was a little crazy or a little outside the norm and so uh so we just started experimenting um and and then once we had this sort of basic thing then we had to kind of okay like we, we, we really sort of got got very excited by the idea but just you know we had to actually figure out a way to practically make it a reality and uh and yeah, so clearing that many clips in in that short amount of time, and sort of figuring out kind of also we had to go back and re you know do new orchestra sessions to get new music in, and um, so all of it wound up being this sort of mad dash. But we kind of knew it had to be done, you know, and 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 luckily the studio was supportive, and everyone I think sort of in a way agreed, uh, even though the, the ending sequence definitely freaked out some people uh, on the team, but 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 uh, uh, mm. but everyone agreed that. Um, the movie needed one more wild swing at the end that is sort of big swing of a movie demanded a big swing of an ending. And so, um, so they sort of got on board with the spirit of it and, 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 and that helped us get it, get it done. But even the shot choice, like the T2 shot you use to me is one of my favorite shots in the whole movie is when this head comes back together. Like how did you decide which ones you were going to choose? Well, there's a logic behind all of them. You know, it's like at that point we're going past, uh, you know, we're going past the the end of weekend, fan of cinema into yeah. into sort of this kind of post cinema idea of sort of which I sort of think of as sort of again, of course, it's part of the larger story of cinema, but this idea of analog giving way to digital, and so yeah. every image that follows is progressively more and more uh, 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 created uh, in computer instead of in the camera. So we begin yeah. with sort of just little more subtle bits of kind of. Um, those kind of visual effects with you know spielberg and whatnot and sort of work our way towards uh, uh of course the culmination of that is 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 pandora of course so so <laughs> uh so so that's a little bit the logic of it um but it yeah. also it also kind of um uh i don't know sort of for me each image also said something about the, the, the logic of it is one thing but then you try to when doing a sequence like that you try to not be following logic too much because there also is has to be something just sort of on a gut level you know, so, you know, sometimes we would sort of try images that did follow exactly a kind of logical chronology or, or, or equation kind of approach, and it just wouldn't work. It wouldn't have the right, it would start to feel just, just like a clip reel. We didn't want it to feel like a clip reel. We wanted to feel like this experiential roller coaster mm -hmm. ride through yep. cinema and through and, and landing into something almost abstract, landing into something that just is almost, it's almost like what, what could cinema beyond cinema be, you know, and try to kind of get into that, <laughs> into that kind of, universe so um so it did wind up just kind of yeah. yeah certain certain images would just work and others wouldn't but those you know those images just i mean yeah they're just so great they'll probably yeah. work uh in any, in any no capacity big deal, no big deal trying to build the, yeah, uh, thank the you montage for that, that represents the the history and life of cinema was, was there really quick was there any movie that you try to get the rights for that they said no yeah, a few. Luckily, not many, uh, but there were a few. But it, it it wouldn't be what you would expect. It was not not sort of you know big kind of expensive Hollywood movies. It was more more things where it's hard to figure out who actually has the rights. You know, so so for instance, I had to swap out a lot of these sort of avant garde shorts. I was kind of pulling from the '60s or '60s New York avant garde scene. Um, that took a lot of you know sort of mixing and matching. Um, uh, you know, so yeah, oh, a few of them had to sequence. be swapped. What a sequence. Damien, yep. we wish we had all afternoon, but I know that you got uh, places to be. Um, same here. Same here. I again, love this. I love this show. As mentioned, um, we love this movie. I literally cannot stop watching it. I'm sorry it's on a screener. Uh, I what I did see it in a theater. No, but we, now saw I'm it in the we all saw it in theaters. We all saw it in theaters. Yes. Yes. Before no it's not intended. Yeah. It's yeah. just <laughs> mesmerizing. Oh, Pitt is incredible. Uh, Margo's incredible. Everything that you pull off, like you mentioned, PJ, like everyone you have in, it's great. Oh. And um, we really oh, appreciate thanks, you taking guys. the time to come on the show. Thanks, man. My God, no, no! You gave me the patron saint thing. I, I have to go on every time now. I mean, I, I don't, I don't know what to tell you. I owe you guys. 
Fair enough. All right, okay. so we'll, we'll schedule next week for you. <laughs> yeah, 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 perfect, yeah. Yeah. perfect. Yeah, I'm in. Thanks, Thanks man. Man. I appreciate you, man. Appreciate Have a good day. You, Have a happy holiday. Yeah. See you, buddy. Oh, you too, guys. Happy holidays. Right. See you, man. Later. We want to thank Damien Chazelle, our friends at Paramount, uh, and everybody behind Babylon for getting Damien on the show. I just, I, I don't know, man. I just love talking to him. And I think that he, like, you know, like he said at the end of the episode, he, he loves the show. He gets the show. He gets to dive into things that he's not being asked on a regular basis. I feel like we hit him with a couple of uh, off the beaten path questions in, t- in terms of the fact that he's doing so much press for Babylon and uh, and, and we tried to think outside the box. It, so, Jake, you were referring to are you referring to the first man answer? That was so perfect no, for Kevin. About, about um the the question about what is the the aspect of Hollywood that you've most had to like the change that you most had to get over, and it right. was about him saying coming into the industry being told that he wasn't going to be able to shoot on film, that he was going to have uh, to shoot digitally. And gotcha. honestly, my you know when we do these, we've all got these Zoom boxes in front of us, and my eyes immediately <laughs> darted to Kevin's box because I was like, this yeah. this this answer is just porn for Kevin, basically. Oh, and also, uh, so interestingly enough, he. He shot whiplash digitally which is interesting because then he ended up yeah and then he because well that was part of it right so like he was talking about that that was kind of what he was referring to is that whiplash came at a time where you know he didn't have the 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 filmmaker presence to want to ask mm-hmm. for film i would assume um and i think he i don't know if he regrets it but La La it, Land, it doesn't look digital to me it I, mean, I don't have the eye for it that you do but yeah. I, I i wouldn't have thought that it doesn't, but it does. And it's like when you see La La Land and you see First Man and you see Babylon, there is definitely a shift in the way it looks. Babylon specifically is probably the most film looking movie he's made, considerable just based on what they're doing with the movie. Right. Um, but also First Man, and we're going to get into Chazelle Blend later, but that story he told about the snow, <laughs> was, oh I God. thought that was so cool. So yeah, yeah. check out um, our first interview with him as well if you're if you're into like, Talks about Christopher Nolan and Dunkirk for the Eddie that uh, Sean mentioned. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, let's get to uh, a couple of movies that are opening or at least expanding wider and then three big ones that we want to spend some extra time on. So uh, we're starting off with Empire of Light, a film starring Olivia Coleman and Colin Firth uh, that's set in. Is it outside London? Is it northern England? Is the coastal area yeah, it's, of, yeah, of yeah. England mm-hmm. um, set in a movie theater? But. This is where my beef with it comes, and I haven't had a chance to really talk about it yet. Uh, the guys reviewed this one earlier, I believe it was episode 240, but dig back through if you want to get their full insights on it. Yes, yeah, so um, it was the I, episode with Guillermo, if I'm not mistaken. Was it? But I'll, I'll double check, I, yeah. I thought that this was going to be a film that was more about the cinematic experience and the power of cinema and a almost like a, a Hugo or a cinema paradiso, and, and mind you, those are rare films, right? So... The fact that I expected Sam Mendes to um, aspire to that is on me and not necessarily on him. But that's not the story that he's trying to tell. Like This is the story of a woman who uh, has a lot of conflicts personally uh, and professionally and how she's wrestling through them and the new people that she meets as this job that she's starting. And the job just happens to be in a movie theater. And so it could have been anywhere. It could have been a grocery store, it could have mm-hmm. been a diner. <laughs> and I think all of the elements of the story would have been exactly the same um, towards the end. The director tries to put some of the uh, affinity for the movie going experience into it, but it felt forced to me. And so I had a lot of hope for this movie and I thought it was going to really touch me in a way that so many of the other films that we've been talking about this year, you know, that get into the love of movie making and what movies can do for a person. And between films like The Fablemans and Bardo and Babylon and uh, Empire of Light did not register that way with me at all. So I ended up being kind of disappointed with it. I didn't hear from you guys, but is that kind of where you are at essentially? Yeah, I, 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 I haven't seen it, but Sam Mendes oh. obviously is a great director that we all love, but, and Roger Deakin shot it. So I want, those are two names we want to point but out. It's but. not even great Deakin's work. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's digital. It's not, I mean, it's not, not memorable. I mean, he, uh, he, Deakin's has done good digital, but I still don't believe a movie about movies at that time period should be shot digital. That's just me. Yeah. I haven't seen it. I understand. It. Um, I don't think shooting on film or digital would help uh, Whitney Houston, colon, I want to dance with somebody. Uh, Jake, you had a chance to check this movie out. How was it? I, did, I mean, it's it's not good. And, and the yeah. reason I say it's not good is because I need to if you're going to do a two and a half hour biopic on on someone, I need to walk away 
with a better understanding of that person than I had when I walked into the theater. Now, I grew up, my sister is seven years older than me and was a massive Whitney Houston fan. So I grew up in a home where Whitney Houston was playing at all times. I grew up with my sister always watching films like The Bodyguard and Waiting to Exhale and, and The Preacher's Wife. So I, I'm pretty f- actually surprisingly familiar with with Whitney Houston's work, um, mm-hmm. even though I was a little bit on the younger side when she was, I think, at her peak kind of in the 90s. Um, I, it felt like reading her Wikipedia page. It, it mm-hmm. very much was a two hour collection of this happened and then this happened and then this happened and then this happened and then that's it. And I didn't feel like I knew anything more. I mean, it is a reminder of how incredible her collection of songs really is. I mean, it was hit after hit after hit. I mean, and they're oh. fantastic songs. Yeah. And if you came to me and tried to make the argument that Whitney Houston had the greatest voice of all time, I wouldn't fight you on it. I would yeah. go, sure. I mean, how, how anyone can hear I will always love you and argue against it. Hell, I, don't, I mean, it's a genuinely, it, yeah, I, you know, I don't feel like the movie did right by her. Um, I like the actress Naomi Aki, but I think the combination of the fact that she doesn't particularly look like her and she really kind of had to lip sync the performances makes mm-hmm. me question whether or not she was really the right person for, for the part. Mm-hmm. Cap. Also, it, it always blows my mind that I'll Always Love You was written by Dolly Parton. Like sure. That, always, yeah. that is one of the most interesting like facts I've, did I've you, heard. Have you, did you hear her, her? Actually, it was a pretty recent statement about someone asked her about, I think asked her under the guise of Whitney Houston making that song more famous than when Dolly sang it. And she said that's one of the best things that ever happened to her because all the money that she made off of Whitney Houston getting popular, she ended up giving it to build schools for underprivileged communities. Wow, that's, that's amazing. Crazy. Isn't that like that's that? Awesome. I, I'm a huge Dolly Parton fan. And just not necessarily like, like from a music standpoint, but just who she is as a person. Yeah, I love stuff like that. And I love that she does stuff like well, that. Well, because I mean, Dolly within her own right, you know, made a ton of money. Sure. The royalty she must have made oh on the Houston song yeah. have oh to gosh. be stupid. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the fact imagine. that she gave, basically gave them all away. Yeah. 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 Um, Sorry, Kev, I didn't mean to interrupt. No, no, no. I, I, I just, I mean, I, I'll echo your sentiments. I, I thought it was overly long very poorly written it felt like a tv movie um and listen at the end of the day i think naomi aki does a great job with it she has the best she can do with it it's only tucci i thought was really good in it too he plays mm-hmm. clive davis um, nice but that's pretty I, great I, it's yeah, good casting and, and, and but clive davis produced the movie so yep. that's an interesting thing as well um oh, never yeah. good never it's good it's fine i mean the, the, <laughs> the movie is not good it's it, it, it's it, it feels poorly made and it's it, and it's you know, I felt like every person on screen did their best with the intentions that they could in terms of what mm-hmm. they had. But Naomi Aki, I thought, did a really good job with the performance. Um, there were just things that I didn't like. I, I, I didn't like I won't even go into it now because it, it, it's it's stuff that down the road we can talk about. But, yeah, I just I wasn't a fan. I, I, I think this was a miss, unfortunately. And I think but I think Naomi Aki, hopefully she'll get some great work later on because she was in what rise of skywalker i mean she's Mm -hmm. she's a really good she's a really good actress i just don't think this was the right script and and performing directing in my opinion uh it's um kathy lemons also is the director i'm just looking up what she had directed previous uh talk to me with uh, oh ease by you that's right uh and talk to me with don Cheadle. yeah talented director um yeah talented director just not a good script it does it get into her movies does it touch on the bodyguard does it do Mm-hmm. Bodyguard specifically, but yeah. I, uh, Jake, I don't think they've got into Wedding to Exhale or Preacher's Wife. I no, think it was just really. Bodyguard, and, and even like the the, the bodyguard area thing of the weird. Bodyguard, yeah. it, it's very strange how they like a handle shot it. at Kevin Costner, but like. Yeah. He's like waiting, but it's actually a shot from the movie. It was so strange. Yeah, it's a, it's a weird. Thing. They, well, they use clips. They use clips from the movie, and yeah. then and then cut to her and Clive Davis off the set. But then again, like they throw in because it feels like such a Wikipedia. They throw in lines that makes me go like, "Wait, what do you mean by that?" Uh, Cl- uh, Clive Davis says something to her like, "You know, like Kevin Costner specifically asked for for you for this part," and she's like, "Really?" And then it goes to the next scene and there's a part of me that's like, wait, what do, you, what do you mean by that? What, what, why, why, why did Kevin Costner ask for her to like, like, what are you doing? Go back. Right, for, right, there's right. so many, for, for so many, like, like not th- thought through scenes. It's incredible that it's a two and a half hour film. Yeah, it's long. All right. Well, over on Netflix uh, opening. Well, I'm sorry. Limited in theaters coming to Netflix on January 6th. Uh, this is a Scott Cooper's new film. It's called The Pale Blue Eye. Scott Cooper was on our show to talk about uh, antlers and he also did hostels and he makes these um, gritty sort of period pieces. And this one is set 
what's the time frame on this? 1800s? You know? Is it that is it that far back? Um, so this is a murder mystery, and the hook is that Christian Bale plays a retired investigator uh, who is pulled back in for a murder case, uh, a suicide case, mur- suicide case that probably has some suspicious things going to it uh, on the campus of West Point. And it turns out that one of the students who is at West Point at that time, who ends up becoming a bit of an assistant to Christian Bale, uh, is Edgar Allan Poe. And it's great. That's a great setup, like terrific premise, great setup. And I thought really solid execution. Uh, Bale kind of lets. Um, so who's the actor who plays Edgar Allan Poe? Do you know his name? Continue. Uh, I'll look it up. Vamp. He's, he's from he's from the um, uh, the Harry Potter. Films. Harry, his name is Harry Melling. Yes. Oh, is yes. it? Mm-hmm. He is a standout because of the way that he chooses to play Edgar Allan Poe. Um, he's very eccentric. He's moving at a different speed than the rest of the film. <laughs> Um, it kind of looks is, like him. Oh, does it look like Poe? Yeah, he I, does kind of look like Poe. I wouldn't know what Edgar Allan Poe looked like, but I'll I'll trust that this guy was cast properly for that reason. Um, and Bale wisely, I thought, uh, Jake, kind of sensed that like it, it's not his movie, so he sat back and picked his spots, which worked very well for uh, the chemistry between the two of them and the way that the entire movie unfolds. Um, it was really good. If you dig, I mean, it's it's like. Nothing extraordinary, but if you really dig tight uh, murder mysteries, you know, period murder mysteries and like uh, Christian Bale bouncing off of uh, another unusual character in the in the film, I, I, I think you guys will dig this one. on. Uh, and, I, and I honestly, since it's in limited release, I, I do kind of encourage going out to the theater uh, to go ca- to catch it because the way it was shot really nails this. It, it's set during the winter time. It, it takes place often in these sort of dark and dank locations around the campus. And that uh, feel, I thought, led to the atmosphere of what they were trying to push forward. And I think Scott Cooper does that really well. Do we know if it's a wider limited release or is it just a, um, I, mean, I, feel like Netflix, I feel like Netflix releases are, you know, never, never wide. Oh, sorry. Yeah. Uh, but I meant, I meant, um, is it attainable limited or is it New York, LA, just in case they get nominated right. sort of thing? I well, like here, here's what I can reason. tell you, and this is probably too inside baseball. The embargo on our junket footage is not till uh, it isn't up till January. So okay. they're not even letting us like promote the film until so, it gets ready for streaming. So, yeah, I, if you can't find the reason we're doing it this week, sometimes we we wait, as you'll see with with uh, Glass Onion and such. But th- this is coming out the week that we're taking off. So that is why we're discussing it now. For you, If folks. you do live in D.C., um, I mean, obviously we're recording the, the movie is opening the 23rd in limited release theatrically it is playing in the dc okay, cool. area okay so it's so not like for, New York you know, LA. Great. but it's like but it's in one theater right. in our area it's probably very hard to find but yeah. um but yeah but i i know we have listeners and in, in, who live in this area so it is just for for those listeners it is pl- it is playing at the landmark atlantic plumbing cinema Hmm. I, I want to sort Atlantic of piggyback Plumbing on cinema. That's the name yeah, of a theater. That's the name of it. I'm not even joking. Yeah. <laughs> the bathrooms better be nice. Yeah. Oh, they're actually they're ironically <laughs> terrible. Um, I, I want to piggyback on what Sean was talking about, just like the atmosphere, because this might sound like a weird comparison because there's, there's no supernatural element to pale blue eye, but I very much got a like sleepy hollow vibe from it, like sort of Absolutely. an 1800s murder mystery, kind of that, that, that era, that look, that period or that, that, um, that, that period or that, that stretch of America. Um, had such a cool, and also kind of like a seven element where in that you have two sort of mis- mismatched uh, people trying to solve kind of, you know, like they're, they're not, it's, you know, the murders already happen by the time they find them. Um, and it's just, it's such a cool, great, I, I pressed play not knowing what the bit was. And when, yeah, uh, it's and it's about 20 minutes before he meets a young man who introduces himself as Edgar Allan Poe. And whenever that happened, yeah. I just went, oh, yes, I'm in. OK, <laughs> I'm sold. I'm I'm so in. Yeah, I, I know what you're saying, because when I got a chance to speak with the cast, we talked all about just the dialect and how mm-hmm. they talk. Um, and they talked at length about how it was this hodgepodge of British transplants, essentially, and a New England accent mm-hmm. trying to form and how long they had to work on that to get it right, because it feels unlike anything that you've heard, but the feels extremely accurate to the period. So um, I, I dug it. I definitely dug it. Yeah, same, um, same. Speaking of movies that went to theaters very limited and then will be available on Netflix, Ryan Johnson has a sequel to Knives Out called Glass Onion, A Knives Out Mystery. Now, Ryan was on our show earlier 
Hopefully you guys got a chance to listen to that. But we said we were going to get into a deeper conversation of what worked and didn't work about this when it uh, got close to streaming. So, Kev, why don't you start off mm. by telling me um, which one you prefer? Knives Ooh, Out or Glass question. Onion? And, uh, and why? So I still prefer the first one, but I still love this one. Um, it was in my honorable mentions of my top 10 of the year. And, uh, it, you know, this is uh, one of the tightest scripts you're going to see all year. It's definitely one of the best scripts I've, I've seen on screen this year. Um, oh man, easily. You know, one of the beauties of this movie is, you know, the constant being that Benoit Blanc is back, but it's a brand new mystery, brand new cast essentially um the cast is absolutely incredible norton uh dave batista kate hudson uh but janelle monet really to me is the is the mvp of the film like her performance is outstanding uh we won't go into any spoilers obviously but there's a lot to be said about the way this film operates um how it will operate on a second viewing um and you know it did really well in its limited theatrical run which you know and obviously that pushed towards the streaming release which is this weekend um, and I think, you know, it's fascinating to me because Ryan is such a brilliant storyteller and a lot of what's happening in these films to me is sleight of hand, like a magician, right? So it's like, there's a lot of moments that he's purposely misdirecting you, um, so that you don't see something. It, it, it feels like you're watching a magician right in front of your face. Like, like who's like completely just the, all the cards are right there. <laughs> you're just not seeing what he's doing yeah, with yeah. them. Yeah, uh, exactly. And, and, and like, and like and there, there's a specific moment that deals with like a drink that is, would, would probably give a good explanation as what I'm talking about. Um, but like pay attention to it because to me, I want to go back and see it again. I've only seen it the one time and I'm just excited to watch because at the end of every whodunit or the, the style of what the movie Ryan's dealing with is when you get that reveal and you're kind of going back and revisiting moments of the film and seeing what, you know, you missed and what you didn't see. Now that I know where things are that I was that I was purposely misdirected upon, I want to view those sequences a lot differently now or, or just play with them differently. Um, this one even more so than the first one, because the first one. I, I love the first one more because I, I think I just enjoyed the cast more, but maybe probably primarily just like the setting of it. And I thought everybody in that film was fantastic as, as they are here. And this is a great film, but this is one I want to, I want to dissect more. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the second viewing, I think is going to be interesting. And um, it's hard to talk about this film with what I love about it without going into too many spoilers. Um, mm -hmm. I still think the Joseph Gordon Levitt dong thing is just hilarious. Um, if you look in the credits, he plays, the dong, the voice of the dong, <laughs> however you want to refer to it. Um, but every hour in the film, there's an hourly dong that goes off. And that voice is Joseph Gordon Levitt. So uh, <laughs> if you go back to the first Knives Out and you were in the kitchen with Ana de Armas's family and there was that detective show on TV, that's Joseph mm -hmm. Gordon Levitt's voice. Clearly, that's uh, the connection that Ryan has with Joseph considering they made brick together years ago. Uh, and I, I love that they've kind and of Looper. continued on and Looper obviously. And um, so it, it is a really cool thing, but uh, the score is it his cousin who does the music, Nathan Johnson. Uh, he's the, the composer. Oh, the music is fantastic. I believe it's his cousin. I know he's related mm -hmm. to him somehow, um, but yeah, I, I love the film. I still prefer the first one, but this is an excellent, excellent continuation. And uh, Daniel Craig is amazing. Yeah. Well, this I want to add a weird... quick thing. Sorry, oh, I want to add a quick thing, just as Kevin is framing it as like the first one versus the second one, because I know what you mean. It, like they're uh, listening to Ryan Johnson discuss it recently. He was talking about how this second one is much more of a comedy and much more of like a straightforward comedy um, in the way that the things that he wanted to discuss and the characters and the way that they work. But he specifically to get a, to get that what got me excited about sequels that are to come where he said he's, he didn't see that as like a trajectory for the franchise. Like he doesn't see them as becoming more silly or more funny or one thing or the other. And so I think we're to Kevin's point about preferring one or the other, but still liking them both. I think he's going to end up doing a great job of giving us something different. that you can prefer something that might strike you just personally a different way, but it, like they're all at the same yeah. caliber. And I think like, that's what if kind the of next one were like on. a horror film. I think right. it'd be cool if it'd exactly. be like a murder mystery horror film sort of thing. And to, to, to Gabe's point, uh, as this movie opens the first 15, 20 minutes, it is so jarringly different than the mm -hmm. first movie, it, like to a point where it feels like you're almost in a different genre. Um, and that to Gabe's point, it's, a, it's almost like weird to call it a sequel because it's just a, it's, it's another knives out mystery. And it's like, 
that's why it's interesting is this is a uh, that's a good thing to bring up. This is a very different movie than the first one. Um, yeah. and, and I don't if you're expecting that A to B to C that you got maybe in the first one, it's going to throw you off. And I think that's part of the mystery. Yeah. But at the same yeah, time, yeah, yeah. it's yeah. still all the things that you love about. Knives right. Out. It, yeah. it, it, it's like it's different, but not <laughs> like, yeah, yeah it's, it's someone. It, but yeah. And I want to give them credit, but I don't know who said it. But I read someone's suggestion that one of them, one future one, should be Benoit at the Oscars. Like a murder happens during the Oscars. <laughs> oh, that's a great <laughs> idea. That feels oh like, my god. That feels like a uh, like a either an SNL sketch or like something yeah. that they would do at the Oscars as like a running bit throughout the show. <laughs> like, Maybe. I think that's that's just, that like, would be amazing. But just have like Ryan Johnson and Daniel Craig skewer the film industry. Come on, oh, like wow. who doesn't want to and see it, that? And if Kimmel, somehow. if Kimmel is hosting, it, yeah. it at the end it turns out that the killer is Matt Damon. That would that's yeah, would be pretty that's, great. This is a great idea. Or Matt <laughs> Damon, and then Matt died. Damon's like, I'm not even nominated. <laughs> this is He's a like, stupid it, it, um, <laughs> thing to say about the movie. Um, but if you're going to sit down and watch it on Netflix. Please give yourself the two and whatever change time. Like it's a kind of movie that and, and honestly, this should be the case for every movie. But this movie specifically. Weaves a, a thread that that like you have to sort of go for the ride, right? Like it's when things hit, they hit because you are in the story and you're immersed in the characters and like I've been saying on the show, like this is the kind of screenplay that got like like certain lines of dialogue get laugh lines. And if you do it in tw 20 minute segments or, you know, you're distracted by stuff, it's not going to have the effect because it, it breaks my heart that people aren't going to have the opportunity to go see this in a crowded theater. So at the very least, if you're watching it at home, make sure that you're sitting down to watch it from start to finish, because the way that it's constructed uh, is meant to be enjoyed, like literally right down to some of the very last lines of the movie are meant to be enjoyed because of the way that this film played out. So that's my only huge recommendation. It's I, I, I think we all agree that the movie's tremendous and um and is a ton a ton of fun. Jakey, one anything else to throw in? Yeah, you know, it's it's the thing that I love so much about this movie is that it's so smart but not in a like pretentious sort of like high class Oscar film kind of way. It's so smart. And, you know, I always say that one of my love languages is watching a, a movie I love with someone who's never seen it and kind of just like watching them out of the corner of my eye respond to things. And yeah. it feels like this script was written and this movie was made in a way that Ryan Johnson is almost spiritually sitting next to us, like just kind of watching our reactions to yeah, things yeah. because he just it feels like he deep down. He's such a great screenwriter that he knows what our reactions to thing is going to be. So I feel like I can every beat that hit. I feel like I could just see him in the corner of the room going, that's right. That's it feels what I, that's how I wanted you to react. Yes. Yeah, but yeah, a hundred percent. Like it just, he like, honestly, like he, he really does deserve uh well, it'll be adapted and adapted screenplay nomination. Like he really, yeah. he really does. And I know like, I still stand by that. I don't think it it lands that best picture nomination. If it does, I think it gets like that nine or 10 slot. I, I wouldn't be mad if it did. I mean, I'd love for them to, to get swooped in with the, with the best picture nominees, but for sure it's got to get a screenplay nomination. Yeah, I think so. And I think at some point over the weekend, uh, Jeremy Renner and Jared Leto's phones are going to blow up. Yeah. <laughs> uh, if they're not prepared for it. I, I, how, how many people will now messages. approach Halle Berry with a whole Halle Berry? Halle Berry. <laughs> uh, all right. So the, the Jared Leto and Jeremy Renner bit is so <laughs> funny. The Jeremy Renner bit to me, yeah. I, I don't know why that works, but it does. It, dude, so, our theater it's died. It's because, died he made an, when it's because he made an app. that, And, and again, he, he, he talked about it in our so interview that funny. he is fans. And loves Jeremy Renner, but I think it's because Jeremy Renner had like that app that failed and was like yeah. the poster child for like weird celebrity yeah. merchandising. But it just because it, just <laughs> like, it feels like a thing that would actually happen. There's also yeah. a really special cameo. And Ryan said this is not a spoiler. I actually asked him about it in TV interview. He goes, oh, no, we're talking about this. But Angela Lansbury and mm -hmm. Stephen Sondheim are in the yeah. film. Um, mm -hmm. And it's really kind of cool how, you know, considering and Kareem Abdul-Jabbar. Yeah, but. Did, but, but Lansbury and Sondheim have passed away since. Oh, wow. That's strange. Right, but did, did Lansbury and Sondheim both pass this year or last year? Sondheim, didn't last Sondheim, 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 Sondheim passed, passed before, right West, before Side West Side Story. Story. 
And then Angela Lansbury passed not too long ago. And then they're both in this movie on a Zoom call, um, which is interesting. And I asked Ryan, they said they didn't film it together. It was all individual calls, and then they put it together on a Zoom. So interesting. All right. Um, A little more prestige. Uh, Like Jake was speaking about, if Glass Onion gets in, it'll be kind of a populist pick for Best Picture. Uh, The Whale is one of the films that I think is angling for more of the um, Oscar Beatty type films. It's Dan Aronofsky. I don't think it's getting in, man. Well, Brendan Fraser's going to get in for Best yeah, Actor. Yeah, Fraser gets in, but... 100%. But and I think, I think Sadie, that, I think that Sadie Sink makeup. gets in? Nah. You don't think Sadie gets in? No, I, I think I think if it gets a Best a- a Supporting Actress nomination, I think it goes to Hong Chow, but I don't think Hong Chow gets in. Interesting. I, I, I think guess. I think the whale gets two noms. I think it gets Fraser and Makeup. And Makeup? Well, both of them are very deserved. Uh, obviously, this is the story of... Uh, well, it's an adaptation of a play by Samuel D. Hunter. Hunter did the screenplay and Brendan Fraser plays the main character whose name is Charlie, uh, who is extremely overweight and is extremely overweight for a valid reason, which you will learn over the course of the of the movie. And it, the the movie is essentially a ticking clock. It actually gives you the days of the week. Charlie mentions very early on that he doesn't expect to last very long like he could be gone by the weekend and he's almost accepted that reality um hong chow plays a nurse friend who comes by often to check on him but is also an enabler uh and then sadie sink is his estranged daughter and the plot is essentially uh can charlie make amends with her before his time runs out um and it's just a beautiful story uh it's a it's a really beautiful story about someone kind of seeing the end uh, and, and again, you know, we can get super deep about this and, and the fact that none of us really know, like, when our time is going to come. But when you are uh, physically ailing and Charlie's ailing and he, you know, his blood pressure is is dangerously high and he looks up um, his condition early on and they basically say, like, call 911. But the reality is without insurance, he can't afford the um, the treatment that he needs, which is another sort of commentary that's built into this film. Um, But the way that Aronofsky shoots it is that he shoots it so that we are uh, contained to the apartment that contains Charlie. Essentially, he can't leave. He orders in food. Things are left at his door. Um, The nurse comes to visit him. His daughter comes to visit him. We never really leave the apartment. We get glimpses of it through the door when the front door is open. We get glimpses of it through the window. It feels like a stage play. Um, But the takeaway is Brendan Fraser's performance. Brendan Fraser's performance. Because while the film probably does deserve uh, makeup recognition for the prosthetics that are done to to make the actor uh, as large as, as he is, uh, it's the performance that he gives just with his face that is devastating. I mean, he sells so many emotions through his eyes and his vocal delivery um, and, his, and his facial expressions that your heart breaks for this character. And it's the reason why I think Sadie Sink deserves to be in there is because of the way that she has to evolve with him like he starts at a place of wanting to do good she comes in manipulative you know and and essentially has to figure out whether she's going to go down the right path that she wants that the father wants her to go to and it's aronofsky so there's never any like easy answers for this because he's not interested in those types of things to me it's one of the softest aronofsky films i mean if you compare it to like mother or requiem like this is a crowd pleaser (laughs) and it's not a crowd pleaser by any stretch um but you got to know going into it that it's a tough film. Like it's going to by the end of it, you're going to be extremely emotional. Uh, you will invest in these characters. And um, and after I saw Brennan Fraser's performance, I said uh, no one's beating him for the for the Academy Award. Now, I know that there are some other uh, actors who are rising up and the conversation has its ebbs and flows. And right now, maybe Colin Farrell has some heat for Banshees. But I think Brendan Fraser's performance was some of the best was the the best I've seen this year and one of the best I've seen in a decade. Probably he floored me and um, and I would love to see him get recognized for the performance, but also for his story, which I just think his story personally is really fantastic. Uh, The journey that he went through Hollywood with its various ups and downs. Um, Kev, anything to add about The Whale? I mean, I loved it. I mean, Aronofsky's been one of my favorite filmmakers since I was a kid. Uh, I mean, it sounds kid. I mean, I saw Requiem when I was 16. I mean, like I, that, uh, he's been in Pi when I was 14 or 15. So it's, it's, he's been a filmmaker that I've loved for a long time. Um, the shooting it in the one three three ratio, I thought was really smart because you're like you said, he's you're boxed into that apartment 
um, or house, whatever you want to refer to it as. Um, and Brendan Fraser, yeah, it, it's honestly simultaneously one of the most devastating yet beautifully life affirming films I've ever seen. The ending is so profound and so special and so monumentally emotional that I just could not move when it was over. I was crying and I didn't, you know, I think the beauty of the film is it really talks about people really, human, humanity really is amazing. Um, and, and, and there's a lot of bad things that happen, of course, that are tragic in our lives and all over the history, of course. But at the end of the day, I believe that people generally are great. And I think that people, are, that, that I, I concept of people being amazing um, to me is incredible. And I love that idea of a guy who's, you know, in a very horrible situation, he's clearly dying. He has, you know, left his family. Um, he's trying to reconcile with a daughter that he left uh, years ago. Um, and at the end of the day, for him to have these reconciling, these thoughts at that stage of his life, you know, it is a really interesting thing. And then the connection to Moby Dick and um, uh, the music is fantastic. And it's just a hell of a performance. It's riveting. It's brilliant. It is devastating. But also you walk out of it with a, with an I, I think a fresh it's I walked out feeling good and I know that sounds bad to say in a weird way but the arc that the character goes on even though what ha ends up happening with the film there's a there's a, a positive affirmation that I walked away with about humanity at the end of this film that I thought was beautiful and I understand the thing pieces and the and the opinion pieces on this film and it might hit you a different way um, but I think the the severity of his weight is something that kind of like, as he said in my interview, it melts away in the first 10 minutes or so, and you see the person. Of course, you're going to see who, this this per individual as they are visually uh, when you first meet them. Uh, but as the film goes on, it's almost like the immersion where you forget that he's severely overweight, even though mm -hmm. they have sequences that remind you of it. And he's just a, you know, a person who's trying to reconcile with his daughter. It's a beautiful film. I loved it. Uh, Jake, I know that this is going to be discussed uh, at length. Uh, when we do our top tens, but anything else you want to throw in? Yeah, I, I really love this film, um, just like you guys. And, and you know, I, I do kind of want to push back a little bit on um, some of the, the, the negative pieces uh, about about this film. And, you know, everyone sees films differently and, and everyone's affected by films differently. But, you know, whenever I watch this movie and whenever I walked out of it and when I continue to think about it, because we, I think what many of us, we we're all lucky enough to see it a few few weeks, if not months ago. I think I saw it in October at the Chicago International Film Festival. I did not see a film about an obese man. I saw a film about things that happened to a man that got him to that point. Mm -hmm. And then I saw a film about how people react to a man who's gotten to that point. You know, I, I the, the reactions to people who walk through the door and see him for the first time. Uh, it, sa it says so much in those moments and uh, about a man sort of accepting where he's at. And where where do I go from here in the limited time I have left? Mm -hmm. And sure, like like if, if the acorn of that is a man's obesity, so be it. But to simplify this film down to that, to reduce it down to it's about a man who's obese to me is missing oh, the gosh. point of what this film is. Yeah. And it's it's so much more than that. And it is about the tragedy that led to it and the hope that can come from it. And that's what I think Aronofsky and Brendan Fraser and, and Samuel Hunter, uh, the writer who wrote the, the stage play and, and the film, I think that's what they're trying to make a film about. And uh, the vessel being a man who is in this physical position. But but it should not be reduced down to to one elevator pitch of uh, 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 that, oh, that oversimplifies the, with the heart of, of that movie. And uh, and I go much deeper into my love and, and affection and affinity for this film uh, next week when we dive into our top tens. We'll keep going and uh, talk about patron saint Damien Chazelle's new film, uh, Babylon, which is roaring into theaters and, and hoping to contend for some Oscars. I mean, Rory is the, the perfect word. I I loved what is this? Three oh eight, three hours, eight minutes. I loved the messiness, the frenetic energy, the chaos. I mean, talk about a three hour film that zips by. It spans a, a, a very specific part of Hollywood, but covers probably a decade's worth of, of time and history and the debauchery that that you know. Whenever we see. 
so many films from uh, I don't know about you guys. I, I whenever I saw you know films films from the silent era. Uh, or, or like post jazz singer films after 1927 as talkies were sort of making their way. I never once pictured everyone involved in making those films at wild and crazy Coke parties with orgies all over the place. I just never pictured that that's what was going on behind the scenes at that time. And right. gives me just this whole new perspective of Hollywood in that era. And, and, you know, it just, and also a new respect for, you know, so many of us, have heard the stories about the the silent film actors who had a tough time making that transition. And I'd always heard that and always recited that, but I don't think I ever truly had a actual understanding of, of, of these moments and how it was so difficult for them. And it's so perfectly represented and it's made with such love and affection and, and Damien Chazelle, has said before, including in my interview, that it's it is a love letter to film, but it is a hate letter to Hollywood and the the two that combine so well um, in the same way uh, that we talked about how Avatar features a little bit of all of James Cameron's films. I mm-hmm. feel like there's a little bit of all of Damien Chazelle's films uh, buried within Babylon. It's kind of a greatest hits of what made uh, the discovery of first man work and what made the the love of music for for uh, for Whiplash and and the love of, of theatricality in Hollywood and La La Land. I feel like you need to put all of those and grind them up and snort them like a line of coke. Then you have Babylon. Very appropriate for this movie. <laughs> you think they'll put that on the poster or on the? Yeah. <laughs> well, considering <laughs> the, 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 like the, the don't forget the opening Paramount logo in the first trailer, the stars around the mountain are snorted like a line of coke. So That's I think that it perfectly fits their their advertising campaign. Uh, Kev, where does this fall on your Chazelle uh, line? Oh, I loved it. I loved it. Yeah. I, I think the the thing that I walked away with the most was this concept of which we already know that you know when you're on film you live forever, but the concept of what an actor does when their career comes to an end and they still have a life to live. Um, and then, you know, that's the, you know, the Brad Pitt character specifically and kind of what he's dealing with in this transition from the silent era to the talkies and kind of, you know, it, it is a fascinating look at that time, but also the, as Jake mentioned, the, the, the craziness, the frenetic energy of the way it's cut together and edited. Um, it is a very, very interesting study and look into that world. And also, a really an idea where we how far we've come in filmmaking since that time um, without going into any spoilers. The movie really does a good job of kind of almost showing that we repeat ourselves a lot <laughs> over yeah. the over the years and films continue That's to point. to tell these same stories or or or, or visions. And it, it is like it almost kind of like was mind blowing to see how much we have done that <laughs> over and over again. Um, but Margot Robbie's amazing. The whole cast. This movie contains some of the best sequences I've seen in the in film this year. Uh, there's a sequence uh, with Margot Robbie dealing with her, uh, a tear and crying. There's a sequence uh, where we're dealing with Margot Robbie's character. as She's trying to get uh, a scene right for the first time she's doing a talkie right if i have that right yeah. and, mm-hmm. and 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 pj Byrne is fantastic uh olivia hamilton who, who's uh damien's wife in real life but also a producer on the film she plays a great director in the film i think it was her name is ruth i believe i have to double check um but yeah the characters are just so much fun and the 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 beginning is so insane and he just keeps upping it and upping it and then once you get to the toby Maguire sequences and everything it just gets oh absolutely insane um i think there are moments maybe in the film that you know i don't know it's an interesting thing i want to see it again because i i I just it is so much to take in there's so much movie um but it's massively uh epic in terms of scale and scope but also lena sangren does a great job uh with the cinematography as he always does uh he shot uh first man obviously la la land brilliant cinematographer um and then justin hurwitz i want to bring up his music his score um the the, it's just beautifully orchestrated and perfectly toned out with the film itself I think he could have um, win the Oscar for best score. I really do. Yeah. And Hurwitz got screwed a little bit for first man. Cause I still think the moon landing in first man is the best piece of music Hurwitz has ever written. And uh, I don't even think he was nominated for an Oscar for that, which is ridiculous. Um, but yeah, his music is outstanding for this. And it, it's, it, it's a, it's a, it, it's a great film, but it's also a real big leap for Damien Chazelle. It's a very different movie for him. Uh, if you can make like maybe like La La Land meets Wolf of Wall Street or something and then oh, that's go a back great, that's a, a great few comparison. decades, it's kind of what it reminded me of. So. so I'm currently doing with this movie what Kev ends up doing with the Nolan films, which is I- I'm watching it on a loop. 
That's right, baby. And it um it gets better for me every time I watch it. I've watched it three times now, but I'm obsessed with it. And it's I'm I'm finding new things about it every single time. And and the most recent one is just how it's broken up into segments that that match a rhythm that go with the score. And yeah. obviously that's what Damien kind of does. But like the initial blast through, you're so overwhelmed by everything that's happening mm-hmm. that I don't think you can fully start to dissect what is going on in this movie until you get to a second or a third viewing. And the reason why, even though this three hour movie uh, will warrant multiple viewings is because it's so damn entertaining. Like mm-hmm. you get to another scene and you're like, oh, God, it's this scene. And then like you'll get to the next scene. You're like, oh, good. It's this scene. And like it's just it's so perfectly put together. Um, I can't I say enough stuff about getting into town tonight. And, you know, the, the great thing about the holiday season is, you know, we all get these screeners and we get, you know, watch screeners with our family. Yeah. And I'm genuinely I, I want them to watch it. So I'm going to kind yeah. of, you know, it's good. It's going to be one of the first screeners. I, I say, like, all right, guys, you know, because they're going to come in and say, all right, what are we watching? I'm so curious to see how they react to this. Like, you know, I, I, I you often ease them into maybe you ease them into it. Bones and all. I mean, once <laughs> they see those elephant feces, man, it's on, baby. <laughs> it's, it is basically it's on. on. <laughs> I, I, uh, I'm curious to see how they how, I'll, I'll give you the update on how because I would say I, I use my folks as sort of like the average movie goer in terms of, yeah. you know, uh, so I'll, I'll give an update next week and let you know. Um, Kev mentioned Margot Robbie. I got to mention Brad Pitt. Yeah. This was a really funny exchange in the text thread because I was, again, watching Babylon today and I texted, God, Pitt is just so incredible in this. And Gabe wisely pointed out, uh, when is he not? And it's uh, I don't I can't think of a time when I would point at a role and be like, wow, Brad Pitt really shit the bed on this one. <laughs> he just He's pretty great. And ironically, uh, PJ had come down uh, the other night and wanted to watch Moneyball out of the blue because he oh, knew that it was a title oh. that was up there for him. And it was nine o'clock and, you know, pop pops getting ready for bed at that point. And uh, I was like, turn it on. Let's go. And we watched it straight through because you can't turn it off once it goes. And it's just that's one of my favorite sort of sort, that that moment where he's uh, at Fenway having the yeah. conversation about thinking about going to the Red Sox. And, and yeah. uh, was it the owner of the owner of the Red Sox basically gives the speech about being the first one through the door. I think that's one of the best thing. Yeah, I think that's the one of the best Sorkin written scenes. It's such a Sorkin scene. You know who is uh, compl- like forgotten in that movie is Philip Seymour Hoffman. Uh, oh, my God. Manager. He's brilliant. He is fantastic. A one year oh contract God, says so the good. same thing to a player that it does to a coach says there's yeah. not a lot of faith there. <laughs> it's so good. It's so good. And and again, Pitt as Billy Bean is just fantastic. So uh, all right, Pratt. we're all highly all, a young Chris Pratt and uh, and then Jonah Hill. Of course, Jonah yeah, Hill. Yeah. Uh, before we get to the blend game, Gabe wants to add. I, I absolutely love this film. So I did I did want to touch oh. on a couple thoughts. Oh, we're getting a, a game rare game review. In. Yeah. No, I, I adored this movie. It, it is to echo, on. To, to echo what the guy said, it's a lot of movie. And I think that's something that's really great about it. I think that there yeah. are a dozen different things that you could take away from it, that it's trying to say, that it does say that it's that it comments on or is just sort of living in. Uh, but one thing that stuck out to me, especially through the end of the film, and I'm, I'm not going to spoil anything, but is is how it discusses film as a language which is something that i've always enjoyed and and is something that i've always sort of uh, been in tune with as like a person who loves film and it and it discusses it on very different sort of terms it, it talks about it as a universal language that if you're a girl from new jersey or a boy from mexico this universal language you're able to fall in love with it and you're able to uh, dream about it. it it talks about it as a, a literal language that is organic that is growing and how it's how it's built off of itself and how everything that's come before has influenced what is now and how important that is for the the good and the bad um how much that has changed like a language for us uh to enjoy and i think it's just to me one of the more beautiful things that it has to say and that it touches on and it and it just so happens to like hit that home with the very end, which you'll know it hits you hard at the very end. Yeah, um, yeah. And, uh, and I just thought that was beautiful. And it's, it, to me, it's one of the more special films that I've seen in a long time, which Damien Giselle seems to do every time he comes out. So by the way, on this third rewatch, there's a scene very early on where Olivia Wilde is screaming at Brad Pitt because he's talking in Italian to her and she goes, <laughs> stop talking Italian to me. You're from Shawnee. And I was like, 
I was like, what is that a reference to? So, of course, I dug up Brad Pitt. Uh, and he was born in Shawnee, Oklahoma. <laughs> really? Oh, wow. <laughs> yes, That's fantastic. That's cool. uh, you know, it's funny that just talking about, it just has very clever ways of, of discussing language. And Brad Pitt's character, when he's introduced, he's he's speaking Italian and he's always playing with language. And he refers to the talkies versus silent films as all, oh, I'll learn that on, I'll learn that language on film. I don't know if he says yes. the word language or not, but. I, his character is, is is another great representation about how we communicate with with each yeah. other as just human beings with film. I think oh it's well, I always, how, how do we think this movie to, does? Not well. Yeah. Mm. I mean, I like know. in what sense? I feel like if you go to the multiplexes, you have Avatar on 17 screens. Um, so people are gonna have to go out of their way to see it. If it cleans up at the Oscars, is it is it like one of those films that gets it's a not big, going big to. bump? Yeah. Honestly, That's kind of its only chance, like, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, we have to say it has two of the biggest stars on the planet right true, now, though. True, true, true. You know, are people going to see it for them? I hope. But 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 I but I think you yeah um, I think we you bring up a good point though because we talk about the reason that we think Avatar is going to do so well is that you know people are waiting you know they got a lot of stuff going on with the holidays and stuff and they're going to be seeing it making a point to see it and I think Avatar is going to be it for the next couple of weeks. Um. And also, you know, the the three hour runtime, we know kills it. And this, uh, sorry, this was this was yeah. over a week ago. A uh, deadline was reporting an 18 million dollar opening. It's not bad, but this was this was okay. eight days ago. So and we're, we're reporting what are his on Wednesday. What are his box offices? What, uh, I, I don't La La really pay attention broke, to. La La Land broke 100. First man, Did I really? think. was Yeah, I think La La Land broke 100. Oh, I think La La, 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 La Land. Like 400 million. Um, um, I think First Man underperformed and Whiplash really wasn't. I mean, I think for the film that it was did well, but it, you know, it was, you can't judge Whiplash by the other one's standards. No, not at all. Not at all. People still figure out. Land made $471 million worldwide. Okay, good. On a $20 million budget, I believe. As or no, well it 30. Should. 30. Yeah. We're going to play Damien Chazelle blend because this whole episode is dedicated to the genius of, of Damien Chazelle, a filmmaker uh, of whom I just worship. Um, but Kev, I want you to go first because I think I know what your pick is going to be. Yeah, so I'm going to go first and then I'm going to roll out. Um, and here's why. So I am going to see Oppenheimer um, trailer at uh, for in front of <laughs> yeah, everyone, you just <laughs> Someone crashed their car <laughs> that was listening to this. So, <laughs> wait, what? Basic, so long story short, uh, every time Nolan releases a trailer, um, especially for a movie like Oppenheimer, he releases the, in this particular instance, there's a specific IMAX trailer that's playing only in theaters How different dare from you the can. one out there. Especially and, a movie like Oppenheimer. There's been no but, movie like Oppenheimer. But dude, get this. So the theater I'm going to is a six story screen. So it has the one, four, three ratio. So I'm literally going to see Avatar The Way of Water for a third time just so I could see this trailer. And dude, I, I saw you the trailer, trailer the on my phone. I saw the you saw, trailer on my phone. You saw it's the non IMAX trailer. You haven't seen well, the, uh, the I, one I'm seeing I is turned 30 it. seconds longer. I turned it. <laughs> I turned it and put it really close to his eyes. Yeah. It so, did. It's uh, kind of the same so thing. So I am gonna I am gonna dip out after this, uh, but uh, if it's for good reason, and I'll report back on how it is. Um, all right. So uh, I mean, yeah, my my, my choice for for uh, Damien Chazelle is definitely First Man. I think First Man's hands down the most emotionally driven, beautifully uh, photographed film he's made in his entire career, and I think it's extremely underrated. Um, I think that people were thrown off by. Gosling and how internal his performance was, which I thought was brilliant. Um, you know, people, you know, want him to speak more, but I thought that the character was so internal and I, and I was watching every emotion go through his face. That's um, who Neil the, was. Yeah, exactly. And I, and I think, I think I, I've just heard criticisms that Ryan doesn't talk much in the film where it's, or it's, and I'm like, dude, that that's what the character, that's who he's playing. Like, and, and, and that, the all end of the builds, day, that all builds to the end of that film. Correct. And you also know. the beauty of that movie to me is the way he shoots it, you know, 16 millimeter, there's different film formats in the film, but as we get to the moon landing and then you uh, sp speaking of the one, four, three IMAX aspect ratio, you know, like Christopher Nolan, uh, Damien shot on 65 millimeter IMAX film. And as we open the, the hatch and, and go in onto the moon, um, we go into full blown IMAX. You're jumping from a, the widescreen aspect ratio to this gigantic. It goes 
and like he literally just opens up and it's so amazing. Um, and Damien told a great story on the show about uh, filming that sequence because it's brilliant how they did it. And Lena Sangren did a brilliant job with it. But Justin Hurwitz's music as as they're going down to the moon to land is some of the most beautifully written music I have ever heard. And also the movie plays like a documentary until that moment, I felt. Um, the way it was shot, way we're going around the house with the family, like it just felt like we were watching documentary footage of Neil Armstrong's life. And, and Ryan Gosling just happens to play him. And we're just seeing this footage. And I learned so much about him and, and what he was going through and, his, and the personal thing. It's interesting because I'm reading Oppenheimer right now. And I'm not saying Oppenheimer and, and Neil Armstrong are obviously the same person, but there's something that Neil Armstrong is known for and there's something that Oppenheimer is known for. And then when you really get into the, the, the story of their lives and the history and their families and, and all the different things they went through, you start to understand more about the, the, the historic moment that they're both related to, right? So clearly with Oppenheimer, the father of the atomic bomb, but with Neil Armstrong landing on the moon, it, it is, you know, very two different things. But what I love about the first man story and what I'm loving about the Oppenheimer book I'm reading right now is learning more about the person behind the legend, the behind the historic nature of what they did. I mean, Neil Armstrong for me was, the, you know, was what I read about in history books. But what I loved about the moment they lands on the moon in the film is all the drama that led up to it and what that must have meant to that person. And then same thing with the Oppenheimer story. It's like, Obviously, we know the, 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 the ending of what happened with his life, but leading up to it, you start to understand the decisions and why this person is the way they are and why they're reacting the way they are at that point. And so to me, it, what I loved about First Man is it, like kind of Jake said earlier about the Whitney Houston doc, uh, film, I learned so much more about him. And I'm not saying that everything I watched in that film was reality. Um, I mean, obviously, you're taking multiple years of story and putting it into a you know a certain window of time so of course you're going to play with fiction to move your story along we're not watching a documentary even though i referred to that it feels like a doc um but i just found the film to be extraordinary and claire foy i thought was brilliant um i just i don't know there was something about that movie that and i know it got i hated that the controversy surrounded that film i think it really hurt the movie with the oh, whole American I forgot flag about that. thing um, and there was the American flag thing and, and um, which is crazy because the American flag is in the movie multiple, multiple times. Um, and it was just, you know, I found the film got hurt by that and I wish it didn't, but it did uh, in terms of box office. But, you know, I think to me, as all the movies he's made, it's the most emotionally invested I've ever been in the characters that he's that he's played with. Um, and I love La La Land. I love Whiplash. I love Babylon. But I think First Man to me is his masterpiece. And I think just every aspect of the filmmaking is dead on. It is just a beautiful work of art. And I, I just I, I want to see it again in theaters because that IMAX experience, that moment when they open up that hatch, um, I think it's the hatch is the right word for mm -hmm. it, I believe, um, is Honestly, one of my favorite cinematic moments I've ever seen, especially if you watch that at home on an OLED TV where it's pure black when you, and, and you put the Blu-ray in and you get the IMAX transition from the wide to the full blown IMAX and you get that sound of that and it just goes full black. And if when you're in an OLED TV and you're in full black, you're in full black. And it is just astounding watching them walk on the moon and how they film that with that gigantic one light that he used that was like. 200,000 watts or whatever it was uh, that, re that represented the sun. So that's my number one pick. No question by far my favorite Chazelle movie. Interesting. Uh, I don't, uh, before I throw it to Jake, I just want to let everybody know that Michael Giacchino's score did not make the shortlist this year for the Oscars. So yeah, process that right, Oppenheimer <laughs> Oppenheimer. I'll catch you guys in a bit. I love Later you guys go. very much. And love you too, uh, in brother. about 40 minutes, the IMAX Oppenheimer trailer will be in my eyeballs, and right, I've been watching luck. the other I hope one. you survive. Yeah. Yes. Oh, I'm, I'm scared. Hold on, because I can do it right now. Hold on. No, no, you, you, can, watch a, you can watch a lesser version of Jake, the trailer. Jake, I got it. It's more you convenient. You don't know my phone? Jake, I got, I got it on my wrist. Yes, I got, I got it on my, my Apple wrist. watch. Yeah. There you go. There you. That's all you need. All right. The way God intended. See you, buddy, See you guys. <laughs> We're definitely not getting Nolan on the show. In, in Hoytema and Nolan, we trust. Love oh, y'all. <laughs>
Peace. I hope well, he walks into time the to theater tell him, but yeah. as, as it's ending. <laughs> <laughs> well, they come in, they're like, actually, we're not playing it for that. And we don't yeah. play it in this theater. But we looped Megan twice. <laughs> <laughs> you want to see that one? Uh, Jakey, uh, where did you go? Did you? Oh, wow. I'm sorry. First, first Man is like, I, I don't think uh, Chazelle's ever made a bad movie. And in fact, all four of his films have made my top 10 list. Um, but if I had to rank the four, uh, First Man would probably be at the bottom. First Man is the one that I actively dislike. You so actually, see, said, see, I, 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 I love it. I do love it. Yeah, I do I, love it. But it's, you, it's number four on my ranking of one to four. And, and I feel like I don't, I just don't connect with it the way that I mm-hmm. do his other ones. And I think mm-hmm. it is because it is, it is a departure for him. And um, his other films have such an energy to them. And this one lacks mm-hmm. that energy, but I think it lacks sure. it by design. Sure. Um, that I somehow I'm going to have to figure out a way to meet that movie on its own level. But every time yeah. I try it, I'm just not. To and I, I appreciate the. I got to watch it on the moon. (laughs) Um, I get all the scenes that Kev loves about him and I find them to be, uh, you know, interesting for what they are. But the totality of First Man does not hook me in the least bit. Um, I went I went with La La Land then for that reason. Interesting. Did did you also or I did not. All right. Great. Um, La La Land to me is uh, is a perfect movie. Um, And I think it's it's so many elements. Uh, The music works incredibly, incredibly well. I I hummed that theme uh, for probably two years straight, two, two to Which three Which is years embedded straight. within Babylon, correct? I dude, I hear it. And I think I hear it, it too. I thought it was only because like I was so obsessed with the La La Land soundtrack, but there are musical elements throughout. Mm. Babylon has its own thing going on for sure. But there are times throughout the scenes yeah. where I'm like, that feels like it's at least and a see, that, that makes cousin. me nervous because I know the, the Academy gets weird when it comes to original score. If like yeah. it uses pieces of outside. So I get I'm getting a little nervous about the idea of there being La La Land score embedded within the Babylon score because I don't want the Academy to come forward and disqualify it. Well, hmm. uh, I, I find this interesting that we had read this week in preparing for Chazelle that he possibly wrote the margot robbie part in babylon for Mm. emma stone and i mentioned with all due respect to her that i just don't think she could have pulled it off and even watching how how um edgy margot is able to be in babylon i i don't know Mm. if emma stone has that in her but yet she's perfect for what he needs to do yeah it's that sort of thing where it would be it would be a different energy but if emma stone were to just meet that energy that we haven't seen her at we would be yeah you know so for sure Yeah. yeah i feel like margot is um organically uh dangerous right like i think mm-hmm. she has a danger to her that i don't know that emma stone has well, the, Har- but- the harley quinn mentality that we have of her i think helps i guess i guess but she's perfect 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 uh for this part in la la land as an up-and-comer trying to break into the industry um her audition scene is an all-timer um her and gosling have again perfect chemistry they've shown it in multiple movies i think it's the best um, the ending of La La Land gets me every single time. Um, it's not the happy ending, but oh, they do. It's a perfect go, ending. Perfect. Go, well, and not even the head nod, but like the sequence that shows you what their life mm. could have been uh, is phenomenal. Is it Ryan sitting down and linking those first few notes of the piano of their theme to mm. her, you know, and instantly transporting himself, the two of them back to the life that they could have led is masterful and um but the head nod dude that head nod the head nod's just, amazing the head nod says incredible. Uh, screenwriters have written entire 150 page screenplays that don't have as much to say as those last two head nods do at the end yeah, of that film it's so true and it's and also when you're watching it in the moment if you think back to the first time you watched it you think like oh how are they going to get together now is, this, is, mm-hmm. is she going to go up to the stage is he going to come down and get her and the, the movie, thank God, doesn't do, doesn't do that. You yeah. know, that's the hokey ending. And it gives them the authentic ending where they just go off and she's with a guy from that thing you yeah. do, which I, I don't blame her for doing that either, too, um, who probably broke up with Faye and they dissolved their musical conservatory ship uh, from the Pacific Northwest. Um, so Tom Hanks terrific. would love this conversation. He would love this conversation. It's the only movie that we're allowed to talk to him about at length. Yeah. Um, and maybe Larry Crown. So. I love La La Land. It's it's the best, the best, the best. Um, and yet you chose. I chose Whiplash. OK, and that's enough. not to take away from my love of La La Land, because um, 
and Daenerys clearly is a La La Land fan. Um, both fan. films were, uh, yeah, both films were uh, number one for me during their respective years. But yeah. but for me, Whiplash, I just love the the smallness and the intimacy and just the brutality of of this film. Uh, J.K. Simmons' performance as Fletcher is honestly genuinely probably one of my all-time top 10 favorite performances ever i just i i've told you guys i am a sucker for a good scene chewy performance and that has got to be on the mount rushmore of scene chewy just screaming and yelling performances but also just i love the movie's fascination with this idea of what it takes to be great and do you need someone like Fletcher in your life? Do you need to undergo and endure that kind of harassment and brutality and, and just horrible treatment to get to the level that you, that you want to be like, is that, is that what the greats have endured? You know, the JK Simmons has that incredible line. The, the two most dangerous words in the English language are good job. Mm-hmm. And you know, you, you were mentioning um, Aronofsky not loving easy answers. And I don't, I don't think Chazelle does either uh, made example by the ending of La La Land, but also made example by the end of uh, whiplash because that final performance, you know, when, you know, he's just giving it his all and he's incredible. And even Fletcher is realizing how much he's locked in and just is absolutely crushing it. And he's bleeding. He's giving it all. And as an, you know, and then he, he kind of gets there and it cuts to black. And as an audience member, you have to ask yourself, could he have done that if he hadn't had Fletcher in his life? Maybe so. That's I mean, that, that, who's to say? But yeah. I just love this study of greatness and art and just the, the loss of innocence, because when you meet Miles Teller at the beginning of this film, he's the sweet kid that just wants to be at this level and he's studying the greats and he wants to give it his all. I I love the screenplay. I love the direction. I love the use of music. But that that J.K. Simmons performance is just an all timer for me. And I, I love what it says about greatness and, and art. All right. Audience picks Amanda Young, uh, Jake Skelly, Connor Bro- Brosnahan and others went with first man. Uh, Josh Heimig, Matt Ramos and others went with La La Land and then Matt Caron, John Palmer, uh, Andrew Federer and many, many others said whiplash. I'm really curious when we should probably just quickly uh, after Babylon comes out, Gabe, or early next year, do a uh, Damien tier list and then just keep adding to it. Or Oh, yeah. Not enough films or. Well, we're not, we can't do it. We're not going to be able to do it because none of us are agree are going to be able to agree what the S is. Agree on the S. I, I would I would be willing. To lend to, to lean your way. And vote La La Land. Yeah. I, I I refuse to 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 call First Man his s. No, it's not at all. So if they, so if that's going to be the situation we're going to run into, then it makes me not even want to do it. Well, <laughs> we'll we'll definitely hold it until his whatever his next film is. Um, all right. There. Because that's just a good second, way to second man. <laughs> yeah. No Babylon two. We already talked about Babylon. It. Yeah. Babylon's. All right. So uh, no blend game next week because as we mentioned, we're going to be doing our top ten movies of twenty twenty two. Well, I guess uh, technically, aren't we doing twenty twenty two blend? Yeah. T- technically. So. <laughs> technically. That makes sense. Sure. Uh, and Send then through the course of those lists, yeah. because Gabe likes math, we uh, are revealing real blends collective top five. You know, you made that sound. The year. It angers me. You made that sound like you were trying to make a dig, but I, I, I guess I like math. Yeah. Math's no, fun. no, no. Honestly, not at all. I, I love the fact that you <laughs> took the statistics and, and figured out our top five. Um, and the statistics so a, bother me. It's, it's a, a the statistics going to keep me up at night. I don't know why, because you do. You, by definition, you love the movie that is our I do, but movie. it doesn't make sense that da-da-da-da-da-da isn't then da 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 You know what I'm talking about? Blame no, Kevin McCarthy. I do. I always do. I normally do. Or and me, because I added, week. I added a movie at the last minute that messed with our, with our. It wouldn't have changed that result that Jake's talking about. Though. Oh, okay, gotcha, gotcha. Yeah. All right, well, listen, you'll be able to hear all of this next week. Uh, the uh, end of the year show is going to drop on what is it, December thirtieth? Is that right? And then, uh, yes, we'll, we'll take a break. We'll take a week off, and then, uh, as mentioned, we'll be back with a new show with Mr. Tom Hanks, the friend of the show. So uh, we hope everybody has a very wonderful holiday season. Um, and a terrific, terrific new year. 
Uh, thank you again to everybody for for listening to the show and supporting us at the course of the year. You guys we are fantastic. Uh, we love you to death. And um, what did I say? What did I say? Something You're good. Wrong? You froze. You <laughs> oh, sorry. I? I sorry. Almost, sorry. I was Never waiting mind. to say anything. So I was like, I know he's still going. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, I was still going. You're like pouring up. your heart out uh, and you froze. And, you can, and, and we didn't know what the hell you're saying. Jake is muted. Jake Are you muted? <laughs> Jake is dying. I've had an unstable connection basically all week. This has been terrible for me. Uh, the kids are, follows, uh, your son, your, both your boys are home. They're just using all the Wi-Fi. It's, it's just, they're just chewing up bandwidth left and right. My pop's got to go, got to go lay the hammer down on these kids. <laughs> uh, follow us on social media. Uh, uh, at Jake's Takes, at Kevin McCarthy TV, at Sean underscore O'Connell, at Gabe Kovach. And the show, of course, is at Real Blend. We'll talk to you guys in 2023. Oh, Oppenheimer. my gosh. Tom Hanks' house.